Welcome to the 8th H.Y. Sharda Prasad Memorial Lecture, being held on what would have been his 95th birthday. I thank you all for being here. The Memorial Lecture, which we try to hold annually, celebrates the diverse engagements of Sharda Prasad, from the freedom movement to media and journalism, from language and literature to design, music and culture. Previous speakers in this series have been Mukul Keshavan, Sanjay Baru, uh, Sugata Srinivasarazi, who is here, Ullas Karan, Ram Goha, Sri Ram Ramaswamy, Jai Ram Ramesh. Um, many of you present knew Sharda Prasad, or Chauri as he called him, in his lifetime, and remember him. Some others here would probably only have heard of him as the information advisor to three prime ministers, particularly Indira Gandhi, but also Moraji Desai and Najib Gandhi. Some others may remember him as the translator of the works of the writers R.K. Narayan from English to Kannada and K. Shivram Karan from Kannada to English, or as an editor of the selected works of Jawaharlal Nehru. Some may remember him as a journalist who started his work with the National Standard, uh, which became the Indian Express, and then he became one of the youngest news editors of National Daily at the age of 24, and then post-retirement wrote a widely read column in the Asian age. What is perhaps less known is Shardar Prasad's long and deep involvement with the world of design, which began probably well before the time that he worked with Charles and Ray Eames on the Nehru exhibition in 1964-65. And that's the time that he made a lot of friends who are some of whom are here. Besides that friendship, he had a long association with the National Institute of Design from the time it was set up finally going on to being its chairperson of its board in the 1990s. Shardar Prasad had a very unsentimental approach to design. Simple was good, as showed in his life and his possessions. Uh, while he has been called the epitome of the culture of Mysore, he was decidedly unimpressed by the meretriciousness of the Mysore palace, privately remarking to me that it was a monstrous wedding cake. He was no fan of ornamentation and could be quite dismissive of the over-decorated temple architectures of his own country. But he was not an unalloyed worshipper of the modern either. At Harvard, he lived in building designed by Gropius, which he said was a remarkable exercise in creating uncomfortable living quarters. For Shadha Prasad, form and function had to go together. I'm delighted that this year we have a very well-known and very innovative designer, Ipu Chaudhary, speaking on a place for design. And when he gave me this title, I decided to put up a photograph on the invite card, which has uh, Shauri working in a kitchen, and there's Ray Eames in the background. Um, Ipu represents an approach to design that combines good taste with a work ethic. Design is not separate from your thinking, from your work, from your business. All, all of these are integral parts and aspects of being at work and fun. Read Ipu's blog. Plug in your stuff, Ipu. It's, it's delightful reading. I'd like to thank Ipu agreeing to give this talk. I should also thank two special people, Mukul Keshavan and Ipu's daughter Uttara, who did some arm twisting, I believe. Ipu's talk today is to me a natural continuation of the friendship between our parents. His father, the famous sculptor Sankho Chaudhary, would frequently drop in at Chaudhary's office. And sometimes after a walk in the Lodi Gardens, would drop in for a chat at our house. I think Itu also came occasionally. I can imagine he would have been interested in meeting someone who was a personal friend of Malikarjan Mansur and Anubhai Angra. Was that the reason? <laughs> Uh, we would also frequently meet Ito's parents at the house of our mutual close friends, the Ranas. Uh, yes, but that's so lovely to see you here. I'm delighted to see you, Ida Ben, after a long time. It's also lovely that this family friendship continues to our, through to our children's generations. Please welcome Ito. Hi, I'd like to thank uh, Sanjeeva Prasad for inviting me to speak here today. You know, our fathers knew each other, as he said, and 
when Mr. Sharda Prasad would visit us, or even if we chance to meet him somewhere, you know, I, as a 15-year-old, I would try to edge closer to the action. Uh, just to hear him speak, I was quite fascinated. The voice was low, it was never soft or loud. It had an unhurried cadence and there was a calmness and precision to his speech and in the words always lucidity, kindness and humor. I remember him telling us the story of an Australian Prime Minister who was facing the heat for sensationally calling the leader of the opposition a bastard. The PM's defense was that in Australia the word bastard was a, a term of endearment and that was the news that day and we were having a giggle about it and then Mr. Sharda Prasad said with that lovely you know elephantine kind of cadence he said well most bastards are born of endearment <laughs> I, I wish I could channel some of Sharda Prasad here, here today. It would be great. So it's an honor to be here, as it's usually the way to begin these speeches. But I'm aware that I follow previous speakers of this lecture who are very prominent uh, intellectuals at the top of their disciplines from uh, the humanities, the sciences, politics, and Sanjeeva deserves credit for bringing to the stage design, which is an area of practice, uh, not from the established streams of learning, and one that doesn't really stand beside them. I'm going to use this as a provocation to understand why that's so. Why doesn't it stand behind, beside them and how did this come to be? There aren't a great many talks about design as a whole. Uh, designers, when they do speak, speak to other designers. Most design criticism, when uh, it addresses, say, the press or a public, even in the developed world, is still obliged to underline the importance of design over and over and over again and tell you how important it is. Please pay attention to it. There are design theorists, excellent design theorists, and I occasionally lean on their work when I practice design or write or think about it. But in the popular mind, it appears that uh, the design as wisdom rocket has, hasn't quite reached escape velocity yet. So I will try to see why that's so. We consider, think of these words, we consider the historical importance of events, historical or we admire a literary flourish. Uh, we might uh, describe things as poetic or artistic. Uh, we might even become philosophical while doing so, or we may accept things philosophically. All of these words have their own resonance and they also help change the way we think. Take the word scientific, I mean, it's a term of great approval and in the 20th century perhaps the ultimate one and an absence of this approval can be quite damning. We are scientific, they are unscientific. It's about, we expect scientific, we do scientific, it's changed the role and the standard of proof, we, ex we expect science to stand behind this. In popular usage, the term is distorted. It's confused with the word systematic, uh, so that uh, astrology, for example, is very scientific. And I take this popular distortion, in fact, as uh, it's, it's a form of, it's, it's a proof of impact, okay? Somehow, if you say the word designed or designerly, I don't think you get quite the same reaction in people. Though, uh, you know, calling, say, a, a tap, a, you know, a designer faucet uh, sometime in the 1980s had a certain cachet, but I think fortunately, like most things from the 1980s, it has been laid to rest. Uh, on the other hand, design as an activity is riding high. It's consumed more and more, and in some situations, especially business, the power of the designer is rising, and we'll talk about this too. But put another way, it appears that design doesn't really have a place on the bookshelf, on, on, on the bookshelf of learning, beside those great traditions 
of learning and inquiry. And given that our consciousness, our consciousness is increasingly shaped by the artificial world, that is, whatever nature didn't give us, this is quite anomalous. I'm also going to try and think about what the place of design has been in kind of sweeping, speculative, uh, historical way. I will also ask if, the, if it were, if design were to have a place on that bookshelf of learning, how might we locate it there? Where would we put that book? Uh, what are the distinctions that set design apart from other fields of learning? Finally, can it give us a way of looking at the world as the great traditions of learning have done? Is it a theory of something? Is design a theory of something else? To be on the bookshelf. Always best to start by asking how the bookshelf itself formed over centuries, going back as far as needed. And to earn a place on the bookshelf, to be a part of the great discourses on learning, to be a part of the lexicon of ideas, it needs a coming together of things. The first of these is antiquity and permanence. Then there is repose, distance, quiet, or a place to stand, just as Archimedes had asked so that he could move the earth. This implies a protection from the vagaries of every day. And finally, an access to centers of power or authority. A mic like this one. Design is as ancient and fundamental as any human activity. With specialized technology and specialized labor, the designer that, who was uh, really an everyman uh, began to be called a craftsman, say a potter, a carpenter, or a weaver, every bit a maker of designed objects, and eventually came to be a member of a trade. Now, a utilitarian trade doesn't easily become an area of contemplation because its tasks are, you know, quotidian, they're familiar, they're also ceaselessly essential to the business of living. Energy is directed to improving these products, and on tacit knowledge, but the tacit knowledge is built painfully via experience and passed on by experience through direct human contact. The opportunities or time to reflect or contemplate or grow this discipline is always going to be in short supply. But all the great disciplines eventually are rooted in the needs of living. The storyteller and the bard became literature and even the abstract field of uh, mathematics supremely aloof from all other fields. Even in their evidence suggests that geometry grew from the need to measure land for agriculture and taxation or other reasons and number systems grew from the need to trade and to carry out commerce. And also we tend to go from practice to theory rather than the other way around more than we really like to acknowledge. Yet, these other activities became fields of study for their own sake and design did not. It missed the bus. One answer might lie in economics, power, and the social status of the craftsman. Now, the economics of craft are obviously inferior to, say, owning and controlling land, and perhaps just better to those who are doomed to cultivate that land. The craftsman cannot truly scale but land can. The craftsman is better off than the, than the peasant, but his income depends on demand that he can't manipulate. And since his scale is inflexible, he can't really profit from spurts in demand. So the status of craft or design lay fixed in this middle position of the craftsman. Besides, utilitarian design is material, you know, terrestrial and mundane. It does not offer to the world a ladder of transcendence. It does not address the great mysteries of living and nature. You know, what is lightning? What are stars? Why are we here? Our religion, philosophy, literature, and the sciences could address God and his creations, nature and man. Religion also offered a moral imagination and a code which explained royalty 
and offered a system of control, thus reducing the need for violence to enforce order. And so religion became protected by royalty, dragging along with it philosophy and other learning. Beyond this, the sciences were useful for governance and military ends. Some craft did receive patronage, mainly to give visuality to power. At first in the palaces, and then as religious centers, uh, which enjoyed a degree of insulation from power, you know, as cloisters of different kinds, different cultures. And these cloist uh, cloisters are the precursors of, of what we call the classical university, which controls the conversations on what knowledge is and isn't. And the grand academic traditions follow from there. And design didn't make that bus. So these are the conditions for contemplation, distance, repose, reflection, when the business of living is not urgent, something best done when you're not busy actually doing the thing that you're meant to be contemplating. So economics, social status, and a lack of transcendent elevation might explain why it doesn't yet command a place on the bookshelf. Now the craftsman and the designer are essentially identical. Both make just two things, objects and signs. Both think about these objects and signs that they make using prior experience and modifying it to the business of living for a given customer. The designer in medieval times, though we didn't call him one, was an applied artist. He was the worker, the craftsman, the artist, the maker. The designer, in the sense that we mean it today, is the result of divergence from this craftsman. That's what I'm going to argue. It's the start of a long process of separation of the maker from the physical aspects of his craft, a kind of specialization, or I prefer the word, an abstraction of his skill. From, say, the 1600s to the present day, for the next 400 years, we observe this abstraction inexorably increasing. What made this specialization or abstraction necessary was reproduction or multiplicative technologies such as printing and manufacture or the ability to make identical copies of the same, same product. Uh, this process had the potential to cut costs to create consistent if inferior quality at least to start with. Um, and earn uh, great profits. It also has social consequences, which I'm going to gloss over. And so the best potter in the workshop is better employed in specifying the master design, and he's wasted if he's actually making a pot. He's now a designer in the true modern sense. That is, he carries a knowledge of the craft the materials and processes, but busies himself with planning and visualizing, leaving the making to another potter as skilled or more skilled than him in a manual sense. So the craftsman's wisdom separated from the physical skill could be embodied in a mold or a die or a matrix, that's a matrix, uh, which is uh, typography's equivalent of a mold, and used to multiply objects. And getting the mold dio matrix right was absolutely critical because cost, efficiency, ease of manufacture, and even transportation had to be weighed carefully because profits or losses uh, depended on them. So this improved the lot of the designer somewhat, but also introduced him to risk. It is at this point that the designer diverges from the craftsman artist. Indeed, the designer could employ a craftsman artist and embed his art in the mold. The designer's specialization was complementary to the craftsman's. He could actually know less about the craft than the craftsman and yet be the one in control. As the process became more industrial, another specialist, an engineer, would further undercut the craftsman mastering process, materials, and production. Working in a team, the duo could sell its products or skill to a businessman, a retailer, trader, or owner. The designer is unthinkable without capitalism and is a product of modernity. 
The separation of the designer's visual, artistic and technological ability from the physical circumstances of his creation, the parting of the mind and the hand allied to scale are essential to the design specialization. Perhaps the freedom of laboring over manufacture gradually allowed the cleverest designer of, say, China wear to cross over to metal products and later to plastics and to demonstrate a feel for product quality generally beyond the particulars of his parent craft. From there, a designer could now cross domains. Famously, Michael Graves, an important 20th century architect, he created an iconic best-selling kettle for the Italian household goods company Alessi. Graves was selected for his cultural intuition, not for his expertise in, say, aluminum or hot water. A fashion designer might plausibly, and they do, uh, direct the creation of eyewear and perfumes and advertising along with fashion because fashion houses see themselves as addressing a notion of style, not garments. The house of Chanel employs star designers and so do all the other big houses precisely for this. Thus, the star designer transcends her specialization to absorb and respond to a set of related values that unite a group of products, often bound together by what we call the modern brand. This is a level of abstraction that is way beyond what the multidisciplinary designer enjoyed when he emerged from manufacturing or publishing. But it is not the last word yet. That belongs to another strand of the story. So what you're seeing here is the evolution of the craftsman uh, kind of starting from the bottom. This is what he makes on the right and what he's responding to on the left. So he crafts goods with simple needs and he designs products introduced to risk and reward makes molds, dyes, becomes more industrialized, standardization, crosses product domains, domains because he learns to understand what consumer groups or customer groups are and eventually creates concepts because he has an intuition about latent desires and drives. So it is often said that the developments of late modernity and the technologies of travel and communication changed the human experience by severely compressing time and space. With the telegraph or trains that allowed passengers to have a passive view of a hurtling landscape, you know, or you know, at, at a pace much faster than a horse's gallop, sustained for hours and undistracted, most of all, by the effort of riding. So the way you saw it was completely different. And the Eiffel Tower had been built and a lot of the world had been mapped. Urban planning was accelerated like never before. Old idea, but accelerated. Edison was busy wiring neighborhoods like a cable wala. Perhaps these experiences and possibilities led to a different kind of mind, what I call a technocratic consciousness. Practically speaking, it took the shape of a supreme collective confidence among the world's elites to see any landscape real or conceptual, as fit to colonize with technology. Science was everywhere. It was both logic and magic taking us in a straight line to a better future. This scientific fever did not leave design untouched. The extremely influential and seminal design schools as early as the 1920s in the Bauhaus and as late as the 1950s at HFG Ulm both embrace the culture and practice of science as opposed to the artistic ideals that had inspired design not so long ago, certainly till the end of the 19th century. Ulm inserted new fields, the new fields, there were fields like cybernetics, semiotics, systems theory into the teaching of design, thus spanning applied social sciences and applied mathematics. This positioning of design as a sort of quasi-scientific field was implicit in what they did. But in the 1950s, 
Academic thinkers outside design from engineering were already discussing what they called bounded rationality or the limits of rational analytic thinking for certain problems and perhaps design was an answer. The pioneering theorist of artificial intelligence and decision taking, Herbert Simon, Nobel Prize winner, proposed a science of design. And he said this is a body of intellectually tough, analytic, partly formalizable, partly empirical, partly teachable doctrine about the design process to tackle hard problems. A decade later, Horst Rittel, looking at it from the other side, coined the memorable phrase, wicked problem. And a wicked problem was meant to describe problems that resist a solution because of incomplete, ambiguous, shifting or contradictory requirements. You don't know what it is that are hard to define and hard to recognize and in turn the solutions themselves cannot be definitively shown to be the best one. So you don't know what the problem is and you may not know the solution when you don't see it. If any of you have any experience of living, most of you will recognize this as a formalized, theorized description of life's problems. For new fields of study to sprout, fertile ground must be readied. Often this is a shift, comes from a shift in consciousness and a sort of public emotional readiness. Maybe mood and not method guide the course of actions that prove decisive. I believe that the mid 1950s, there was a recognition of some of modernity's implications or excesses, depending on where you stood. The perceived failures of uh, technocratic planning, the perils of mass production and consumption on ecology. More subtly, modernity seemed to have some network effects, which um, simple way of saying it is that they concentrate human activity, they magnify fluctuations in catastrophic ways. In some, perhaps a technocratic utopia was looked ungovernable and probably out of reach. Not a bad thing, not a bad thing, because there was also a queasy suspicion that unplanned organic development with its many defects had certain protective properties that seemed to uh, make them better at diffusing shocks and not disintegrating entirely. Even planning as a whole was receiving a critical relook. Maybe, maybe Dharavi was better than a planned slum. Maybe. Clearly humans were in the way. Humans were spoiling the picture. Any system with man-to-man -man or man-to-object interactions multiplies complexity and resists modeling. Complexity then began to enter the discourse, even as it was, perhaps ironically, already being mathematized. But the fact that real-world problems resist mathematizing is exactly what the phrase wicked problems was meant to convey. Design starts where computation ends. You heard it here first. <laughs> After the attempts to teach design to be scientific arose contrastingly, an appreciation of its methods in the US and UK after teaching it something, so let's try and learn from it. Distinctive features and styles and its potential is a surprisingly potent method of tackling the issues of complexity and intractable wickedness. This drew people to design. Now what these methods were, I'll summarize very shortly. They are not magic, at least to those used to thinking without a preformed method. And they are certainly not the jagir of designers. A prodigious amount of theory has emerged on this area from design academics. It describes the mental processes and offers methods and stages. Most of it has remained in the side streams. The practitioner community eventually came to the party. And by the mid 20th century, design was a distinct professional category. You could be called a designer. And decade by decade, economy by economy, because things change at different paces, uh, we began to see a growing hunger for an expanded role for itself. Design 
seeking an expanded role for itself and accordingly professional identities have become more fluid. A hint lies in these definitions of design given by uh, designers and you cannot fail to see a high-minded concern from them. Uh, they, they don't seem to be speaking at all like a designer in say 1800 or 1700. Uh, a seat at the table, this became the rallying cry for this yearning. So this, what we want a seat at the table, why can't we on the be on the boards of companies, why can't we run government? But many design practices go about it in their own much quieter ways, designing for sustainability or for good or for change, thinking up ways to eliminate products. For example, one of the interesting practices I do know tries to eliminate design products. Um, something like a advanced medical practice uh, that I know calls itself a deprescription practice. It helps you get rid of medical prescriptions. So this is a kind of collectivist urge that we began to see. It's free from subjectivity or you know, the, the designer's personal love for what he does and uh, free from commerce or relatively free from commerce. But the real impetus to the recognition of design as a thinking style came from business. Now, IBM was among the first companies to really place design at the core of its practice, uh, possibly to compete with uh, European rivals for whom design was much more innate and much more part of their culture. But the explosion of technological value unleashed by the digital revolution and their takeover of investor value really turned heads. So Apple, Microsoft, Google, this was a group of uh, new companies enabling new ways of working and thinking. And then following the crash of 2000, another wave of companies enabling new ecosystems for old businesses or old industries like shopping, driving, watching TV or cinema, or traveling or staying in hotels. You know who these companies are. Management firms are buying design firms too. McKinsey has acquired several firms, KPMG, many of these large management consultancies, some of them have up to 15 firms. Perhaps it's their defense against disruption. In many of these products that these companies create, design's role may appear to be contained largely within the objects that these companies create, making them functionally superior, pleasing to use, well fitted to their tasks, well thought out for their relevance to users. But often systemic interventions are required. Just as the light bulb catalyzed the electric supply industry. So if Edison had been a, a kind of startup today, he would have called the light up the killer app of, of electricity. He would have said the best way to get people to wire up their homes is give them this uh, amazing thing. Just as the modular razor created the razor blade industry came the iPod. And this was not merely a cool new player. Uh, apparently, Bill Gates first saw one and said, this is cool. Are you sure this is um, Mac only? Okay. So, but this was not merely a cool new player, but it introduced a way of licensing and buying music that addressed a problem. So a new type of designer is created who studies and, as the word goes, intervenes in systems or the web of interactions between people, products and services. She dreams up and accelerates, for example, an Uber or an Amazon. And the extraordinary unprecedented claim is that design methods can now tackle anything. Dental hygiene or mid-city parking, these are all systemic wicked problems. This new breed is not necessarily trained at classical design schools. So complete, so complete is the separation of mind from the senses and the hands that its practitioners would have been unrecognizable as designers in any other time, in any other century or any other decade perhaps. 
This is the final level of abstraction that design has reached. So it's a section of academics, businesses, and the design profession changing the way they relate with each other. Masters courses in this sort of design are taught more likely at centers of technology than the old schools of design. So Carnegie Mellon or the famed D school at, at Stanford, they, that typifies this kind of um, education. And just outside Stanford University is a street that houses the world's most important venture capitalists. If you're not on that street, uh, you're a second tier venture capitalist. And this is an entirely new kind of business financed by an entirely new kind of capital that trades risk for equity. Again, capitalism fashions a new design and is fashioned in a new design. So if design were to be a field of inquiry, what does it have to tell us? Well, you are the final level of abstraction, you create systems, human interactions. We won't be seeing this now. So we come to the shelf, the bookshelf that we've been talking about till now. A man called Charles Peirce, spelt Pierce, pronounced Peirce, a turn of the century philosopher and scientist, positioned what he called abductive thinking as a part of the logician's toolkit, recognizing the limits of deductive thinking in the formation of hypotheses. And in abductive thinking, a selective guess is made after, after considering and observing something, and that selective guess is entertained as valid, not taken as true, but entertained as valid, and acted on. If it works, if it works, this kind of pragmatism was seized upon by design researchers as support philosophy for proceeding in a manner that otherwise could be called shrewd trial and error. So if deductive thinking is an if-then kind of thinking, you could say that abductive thinking can be called a what-if kind of thinking. So to abduct something away from the main line of thinking. This has something to do with the method which I promised to reveal. The method is you propose a partial solution which solves one aspect of the problem, that aspect of the problem that seems most promising or most, most worthwhile to solve. And then you design the rest of the solution to synergize with your partial solution even if the result does not properly solve the other aspects of the problem. The question to ask is whether the new state is preferable, the new state that results is preferable to the present one. That is, the many synergies between the partial solution and the whole, do the benefits of these synergies outweigh the disbenefits of leaving part of the original uh, requirement unsatisfied? Often this process leads to looking at the question in a different and more productive light. If it is, then the inference to observation, as, as, as Charles Peirce called it, he used different words for this at different stages of his life, but inference to, uh, to uh, observation is what I like. It's valid even if you don't know for sure that it is true in a scientific sense. It is not the absolute truth, but it's valid because it works. And the best inference is the one that's most productive, not the one that's most provable. An example from the design thinker Nigel Cross might help. Say a group of friends meets in the evening to watch a movie together. And the problem is the choice of film. Observation shows that they don't entirely agree with each other on the choice of film, nor entirely disagree. Uh, there are some stubborn ones, uh, the usual kind. There are some movie buffs. There are some unconditional cooperators who are self-sacrificing. There are some conditional cooperators who are perfectly happy to fall in with a plan provided 
Movies start at different times and they're at different distances from where the friends have agreed to meet. Meanwhile, time is passing. Sorry, time is passing. And uh, they, some of these options will cease to exist. In, in, as, as, as we are arguing and working it out, some of these options of movies that we're going to see, will the movies would have started or the places would be too far to get to. The threat of a wasted evening is now starting to look quite real. Uh, so a designer might hypothesize that the true intention of this plan, this movie, should be framed as, you know, the intention of having a really good time in the company of friends. And therefore he proposes that if we spent an evening drinking beer, this would serve that purpose quite well. The original purpose is very well met. It is on flexible time, flexible budgets. The movie buffs can get together and plan another evening. So it's a partial solution to those problems. A very good solution to one aspect of the problem. And everybody goes off and has beer. They don't watch a film and everybody's quite happy about it. Wicked problems have wicked solutions. So let's get to the shelf proper now. And if you look at the distinctions of the different sciences, the different great subjects from design, what are these? So to start with, we have science. Science is a theory of nature. It is uh, completely objective. It is empirical. Its sole concern is the truth. It's the sole concern that science has is the truth. Or you might have humanities, uh, also sometimes called the arts, uh, which is the truth, yes, but it's about the human experience and attempts to answer or explain. So it depends if you're in the social sciences, you might have a more explanatory flavor to it and you, you might not otherwise. But it is, it is looking at these kinds of truths and its concern the terminal concern is probably justice or equity. Uh, you have something like mathematics which proposes a special case. So mathematics is it's hard to place as a science sometimes because it's, it's symbolic, it's abstract, it is deductive, it's not empirical. It's the only of the sciences that absolutely owes nothing to empirical observation. Uh, if it's uh, right in theory and wrong in practice, well, um, it's the practice that's at fault, for sure. Uh, so it's a set of self-evident truths, uh, self-evident if you're willing to put in the work, which actually proceed from axioms and therefore uh, can't really be called empirical. It's a special kind of a science. Uh, doesn't fit in very well here. But if you have, on the other hand, arts or art. So you have the verbal arts, you have, you know, the visual arts, you have performing arts, all kinds of arts. These are non-verbal, sensory, and what they are concerned with is, they, they work through expression and they are concerned with the human experience. Now, all of these rest on philosophy. And what philosophy does is it spans the great streams horizontally. Uh, letting all of these subjects draw from it to the extent that they want to draw from it. And, you know, they rest on it, on, on, on the bookshelf. Design is a funny one. It's non-verbal. Design is non-verbal. Uh, it doesn't even use words as part of practice. So it's like you have numeracy in the sciences. You have literacy in uh, the humanities. Uh, it has been proposed that you actually have modeling or as some people have called it graphicacy as a form of design literacy. You might call it a kind of design awareness. And uh, it, is, it is certainly not deductive, but it is logical. Uh, it is concerned with humans, both at the individual and collective levels, but ultimately it's pragmatic. And what it's concerned with is not truth, justice, or experience, but appropriateness. I'll place that book on top of the bookshelf uh, because 
you know, as a designer, it had better be easy to reach and pull out. And, you know, the book on philosophy, you can only consult by lifting the others. So it's, it's best that we, we don't, you know, pull from it too often. And maybe the reason I've done that is that it's on the other side of philosophy. It's a kind of antithesis. Because if philosophy is uh, thinking about thinking, which it is in some sense, well, maybe what design gives us is that it's thinking about doing. Maybe it's a theory of doing. And maybe that's the reason, if not a, a fat tome, at least a slim volume deserves to be uh, somewhere on that bookshelf. If it were to be on that bookshelf, and let's say, what would that mean? It would mean that people who are not designers are taught design. I mean, we are not historians and we do study history in school. We are not physicists, we do study physics in school. We were just discussing before this, where is Mossam about the shameless way in which the social sciences, uh, social studies as they are called, are treated in school, where you are really made to memorize uh, what you have to do. But nonetheless, you are, you are exposed to it in school. If you were to do that, what good things might result? And there's nothing new under the sun. And unlike the sciences, there is no, uh, the science has this wonderful, if, if science is Batman, you know, it has Robin. Robin is technology, who is the boy wonder that does things. Uh, but that design doesn't have that. Design, in fact, probably uh, goes uses technology to get things done. Design culture may provide correctives to how we think. Formalizing it might train people to think better, or at any rate, to not discount ideas that seem crazy. Remember, if they are as valuable as the hypothesis they generate. So if, they are, if the hypothesis they generate is valuable, the ideas are valuable, what if it were true that, that kind of thinking. So as a corrective, design may be a useful way to loosen the grip of the technocratic mind. May be a good way to loosen the grip of people who believe that just about anything can be easily fixed. It may be a way of helping people understand that humans, they define problems in terms of what it feels like and not necessarily what it is. It might elevate the place of experience, human experience, as opposed to running a life completely based on rationality. What's wrong with that? Well, uh, there's a a thinker called Rory Sutherland who puts it, gives this example in a very interesting way. And he says that there's a train that takes uh, about three and, a half, three and a half hours to go from London to the, you know, the southernmost point in, in, in England and where people take a ship or a, do a ferry crossing from. And he said, what if this time was to be you know, compressed by 45 minutes? Then it would make great difference to our connections with, with the rest of the continent. and everybody agrees and the, so and the solution to do that, the engineering solution is to build an entirely new track, an entirely new train, which would go faster and which would make this, make this possible. And uh, Rory Sutherland argues that the cost of this project, which is six billion pounds, says if instead you had uh, more legroom, had larger tables on which you could get work done, free fast Wi-Fi, all of these things that those trains don't have, you could also have the world's top supermodels parading the trains up and down, serving free uh, Chateau Petrus uh, champagne to, to um, everybody on the train. And people would actually ask for the journey to be made longer and not shorter. And you would still have, for the entire life of the train, right? And you would still have five billion left over to spend. So the idea that the idea that experiences matter or that intangible value is real. Intangible value is is not something which you can giggle at and hide. Intangible value is indistinguishable from other kinds of value. Numbers don't tell the whole story. Maybe 
a mind trained in design would help us understand this. The economist John Kay gives the example of the health service in, in England, which uh, had people responding to, to queries from anything from one minute, two minutes, three minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Uh, and people said that the, the service was unacceptably slow. And then there was a crackdown and they said every, every call must be answered in within eight minutes. And the result of this call was very unexpected. So earlier you had an even distribution of calls. You had some calls answered in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, fifteen 15 minutes. And after this intervention, all calls were answered in eight minutes. Even the ones that were being answered in one minute or two minutes or three minutes, because human judgment was being used to figure out which ones to respond to in what order. But with the, with, with the eight minute filter, all calls were answered in eight minutes, even those which could wait, and even those which couldn't wait eight minutes. As there are some calls which could wait an hour. It would help dispel the notion that problems have one-on-one -on -one perfect solutions. They don't. It would encourage the idea instead that problems and solutions are interlocked and they are co-defining. In other words, we reveal the problem when we attempt to solve it. This is, the, this is the design way. It would break the consulting paradigm, which would give me a great deal of pleasure as a consultant. Uh, and it would make the process appropriate. The pretense that there are stages in a consulting process and that when you are done with discovering data, then you are going to do some finding out something from it. And when you're done with that, you are done, you're going to go ahead to design something. And then when you're done with that, you're going to implement it. Very sorry. Can I get back to the facts first? I'm sorry. I've just had another idea. Can I go back to it? Uh, not quite. You're a consultant. So uh, the idea that solutions to problems might be indirect. I mean, for example, um, forest fires, uh, when they were studied with satellite data carefully, a strange thing was learned. And the earlier policy had been zero tolerance. If a fire starts, just put it out wherever it is and uh, just don't let the forest fire develop. And this turned out to be a very ineffective strategy. And what you know, satellite analysis of fires showed is that uh, allowing some fires to burn themselves out was a better means of uh, making sure that the really large fires didn't take place. So sometimes organic systems, like I was saying, have the ability to be self-correcting in this way. All of these would result in better public intervention, or at least a better appreciation of them from the ungrateful public. It would enable a going from practice to theory rather than starting from theory. It would enable the introduction of behavioral science for good, uh, what uh, one writer has called positive paternalism. So for example, the idea that I don't know if you've, any of you have read the book Nudge. I'm sure some of you have. The idea that uh, by changing defaults and by changing the way things are displayed, uh, behavior can be modified towards more healthful behaviors, uh, which sounds like paternalistic because it sounds like you're telling people what to do, but they do have the option to not do that should they, should they not wish to do that. So for example, if I told you that a portion of your salary was going to be deducted towards a pension fund by default, but you could overwrite it. So this would be a nudge towards making sure that many more people met their objectives without harming those that didn't, sort of. It would promote a culture of experimentation, of small trials. Maybe we would see design as a core competency for governments, uh, not a ministry of design to regulate design, to tell design or to have a design <laughs> policy for designers and for education, but a design policy for itself. Well, we have a planning commission. <laughs> By another name, just a suite. 
Maybe it would also restore a place for aesthetics in public life. Maybe it would be the, uh, the basis for a great education. A lot of work has been done on this area uh, by referring to design as what is called the third way. Which ever since Plato, we've been looking for a third way. So there's the, the rational, the scientific, and uh, the way of poetry, and the way of uh, emotion. And there is a third way, which is the way of action. So what is it that you learn from, from taking action? the third way as a means of completing um, an education. So there's quite a lot of good theoretical work done on this and some practical work. All in all, a better future built upon a better present, not something we have to wait for. Thank you.